Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to In the Reef, episode number four. You might have heard the phrase, in like a lion, out like a lamb. Well, since the last we spoke to you at the end of October, the Barracuda have played five games and gone winless while fading to the bottom of their division. <laughs> Let's talk about it here with the voice of the San Jose Barracuda, Nick Nolenberger, and your man on the scene, Kevin Lacey. How are you doing tonight, boys? Doing pretty good. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I'm doing I'm doing great. Um, I expect to be doing better after this weekend when we get two big wins, uh, right? <laughs> I hope so. I certainly hope so. We need to get out of this little bit of a schneid the team's going on. You know what happens? It's a young group. It's the youngest team in the American Hockey League. There's going to be some growing pains, but um, November has not been a friendly month so far. Team's 0-4-1, so certainly would be nice to get a couple wins, maybe get some momentum going. What's crazy about this little stretch is it's coming off back-to-back shutout wins, so um there's certainly some inconsistency to this group so far um and again it's been a little bit of a tough stretch in november but hopefully things are are going to turn around and turn around quickly well during this stretch we have seen multi-point games we're trying to look for the silver lining here but uh, multi-point games uh from five guys and i'm going to butcher their names but i'm going to go for it anyway uh weinger yep correct ding 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 gregoire (laughs) gregoire gregoire all right uh (laughs) Is it is I'm and I'm is it Wheel? VL VL. Yep. Okay, uh-huh. okay. I know these two. Suamella, you're tanking. Yes, you're tanking. Yep. yep. <laughs> Including you're tanking, getting his first points and his first goal versus San Diego. So I mean, Nick, over these five games, is it a case of because we've seen both Cornish and Short Ridge get starts in these, and three of these games. Barracuda were able to score three goals. Obviously, there was the shellacking in San Diego. But what are you seeing that is not happening that was happening in October? Well, just going back to the most recent game, I mean, when your goalie gives up nine goals, it's kind of hard to hide from that. You know, I, I think it's hard to, to to beat around the bush and try to say that some of it wasn't on his shoulders. But, you know, just off you know the top of my head from what I remember in the game live, there was five breakaways that San Diego had. They scored on four of them. Um, they scored in a similar fashion on every single one of them where you got the goalie moving from one side to the other and then you're able to lift it under the bar. Um, the only one they didn't score on, from what I remember, um, San Diego's Jack Kopaka missing that. So, I mean, it was just one of those nights where you're giving off grade-A opportunities and unfortunately your goaltender can't make that timely save. And he made a couple saves early, I thought, that, should have probably been goals as well. So it could have been a double digit, uh, you know, type of situation like that. So it's tough to kind of look beyond the most recent outing. Fortunately, it's just two points. Now you can look ahead, try to have a short memory and, and move forward. But um, you look at the numbers from a goaltending standpoint, Kornosh's numbers are pretty solid before that game. I thought um, he's had some moments. He had those two shutouts back to back. But overall, defensively, I think our E group has been a little bit thin at times um, with injuries up top. And it's been stretched thin and, you know, for a while we played with just six D's, so we had no extra, no opportunity to change up the D course. So, um, you know, there's been some growing pain, certainly. Uh, it looks like Jake Middleton's going to get back in the lineup tomorrow night, which should help a lot. Um, a veteran guy in the AHL and has some NHL experience as well. Um, of course, we saw Dalton Prout go up after a couple games. I think Prout, you know, he played good last night in Anaheim, but he struggled himself in San Diego. I think the whole entire defensive group did so. Um, you know, hard to get beyond a nine to three loss, but you try to look at the positive side of some things. And you did, as you said, your Tyken gets a goal. Jeff Biel got a couple of assists. Auntie Sumo, that was the best game he's played in two years in the American Hockey League. He had eight shots on that. Um, should have probably had four goals. So, um, try to look at the, the glass half full. There are some positives that came out of San Diego. But for sure. Sumo had more shots in, on, in Wednesday night's loss than he did the first four games that he played. So that was, that's promising. And in, in my opinion, uh, Nick, I wanted to ask you actually just about like the consistency issues with the Barracuda so far, because I recall last year, coach Roy Sommer had an interview with you right around, I think January, where he was saying that even the period to period consistency was a problem and they hadn't the team hadn't played a full 60 minutes to his liking and even Wednesday's game. And I think overall, just this season, I've noticed this trend where the Barracuda start well or start poor and then they finish well or start or finish poor in the offset of it. So is is it like the shuttling issues with the Sharks constantly changing the Barracuda roster, game to game roster, or is it just uh, because they're 
have been, except for on the defense, but forward wise, there's been a lot of different options that they could use. Is it just the team hasn't had enough time to gel? Uh, do you have any thoughts on that? You know, I, like just speaking to the coaching staff and what I've seen, you know, watching these games, it, it's hard to circle one specific thing. Special teams during this stretch have been a huge factor. I mean, the penalty kill which has been one of the best in the AHL over the last five years, you know, yeah. the Barracuda's first four. It's been yeah. a top 10 unit, I, I want to say, every year. I mean, it is really struggling to find any sort of consistency. I want to say Third for year. the last five games, they've given up multiple power play goals. And what's odd about it is the Sharks and Barracuda really try to run a similar system. So when these guys go up, the, the transition isn't as drastic. Um, they're thinking less, just kind of playing and using their natural ability. So, you know, I do want to talk to the coaches stuff. I'm going to I'm going to speak to him tomorrow just about, you know, again, we don't you don't want to harp on the, the special teams over and over, but it's struggling in a big way. The penalty killers really struggled. And what's odd about that, if I'm not mistaken, I think the Sharks have one of the best PKs in the league, if not the best. So, you know, it's not a direct correlation, but there's just some weird things that are kind of going on right now, especially with. Guys like uh, John McCarthy is one of the best PKers in the, in the entire American Hockey League. You know, Evan Weinger has been banged up. Uh, Manny Weeders coming off a major injury. Those guys are speed guys that are good penalty killers. I haven't been able to kind of go at a full full pace this year. Um, special teams is kind of the first thing I've looked at so far. And then, you know, just the youth. You don't want to use youth, youth as an excuse over and over. This has been one of the youngest teams of the last four years. But they are the youngest group in the entire league. I want to say they have double-digit rookies. Um, there's guys like, you know, you look at your Tykin. You know, he knows minimal English. So for them to have to translate systems and what they expect from him, there's an adjustment period, right? I mean, they're using other guys like a Latunov or a Djokovic to translate on the bench and try to relay that information. So, you know, it's just there's growing pains with these young players. There's inconsistencies with young players. If they weren't inconsistent, they'd still be up in the NHL. Guys like, you know, your right. Tyken Bergman. So. You know, again, hard to pinpoint one thing. You don't want to circle one group and one guy and say that's the problem because it certainly has been more of an overall team issue. Um, but inconsistency, you know, through a 60-minute game has been a major factor, as you mentioned. That was a 4-3 hockey game going in the third period. Yeah. So yeah, exactly. I mean, it's just weird. I, I, there's no – there's no. it's hard to put your pulse on what's going on right now. I think guys are starting to grip the sticks a little bit. The pressure is on. Coaching staff is feeling it as well. Everybody's kind of pressing right now because you just want to get back in a group. So – um, talent is there, which makes you excited for, for what they can do. It's just about putting together and, you know, trying to put a full 60 minute effort. Cool. Hey, Nick, uh, since you mentioned Evan Weinger and Manny Weeder earlier about the, the penalty killers, two of the better penalty killers on this team, both seem to be out with injuries. I know, uh, Manny got hurt last game. Evan has missed the last three games. Uh, Patrick Smith sent in a tweet at P Smith one, one, four of when is Sasha Chmielewski going to return? Uh, so for all three of those guys, do you have any kind of an update? What's going on? I heard chimolevsky has got a walking boot. Is yeah, he has been wearing a walking boot. I think he suffered an injury in opening night back on October 4th. He tried to play through it. I don't know exactly what the extent of the injury is. It's, it's enough to hold him out right now. Um, mm -hmm. All indications are he should be back in a couple weeks. Um, but still don't really know. I mean, they aren't really, you know, giving us too much of that information, nor do I try to ask too much. I sure. keep it, you know, uh, upper body, lower body. But yeah, Sasha is, has been wearing a boot. Um, you know, as you look at this lineup, the expectations were certainly high, especially with the way that Sasha played and the way that Ivan Chikovic played coming into the year two years ago. And maybe yep. that wasn't fair because it's been a slow start. I know Sasha struggled out of the gates again, dealing with in injury, but Ivan has struggled to find his offense. I think he, he's just got one goal. I think he maybe has an assist, if I'm not mistaken, but it's been a slow just start, a especially goal, yeah. From, yeah, from what we've seen. So, um, you know, the expectations on the group maybe were higher than they should have been. Now we're only a month and a half into the season. So you don't want to make any sort of old rash, you know, decisions on players. Um, but, yeah, again, I mean, they need production from a lot of guys that haven't been able to find a consistent, you know, way to find the back of the net, consistent way to contribute. So, you know, it really starts up and down the line. If you can look at everybody in circle, everybody is having, you know, their moments where they've they played well and moments where they've struggled. So um, as a whole, the team has just, you know, struggled pretty much as a unit this year. I want to just ask you about this one particular player, uh, Jeff VL. Um, I'm just curious as to your thoughts in his overall play this season so far, because the thing that stands out for me, specifically Wednesday, was it was a 9-3 to loss to San Diego, and Jeff Viel was plus three. 
So he's got to be doing things right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that whole line of Suomela, you're taking, and VL was by far the best line. They produced all three goals. Um, you know, VL was buzzed out there. I thought that was a nice little combination because, you know, as we all know, Antti has struggled since he's come back to the American Hockey League since, you know, really promising start with the big club. I think everybody expected him to get back up pretty quick the way he started his career last year in North America. He's just struggled so much in the American League last year and, and, you know, didn't overly jump off, you know, the sheet in training camp to make the big club. And everybody's like, okay, he'll come back to the American Hockey League and he'll start, you know, dominating the league. And again, it's been a slow start. So you look at what made him successful in that game in San Diego. And the one, you know, guy that you have to look at is probably Jeff Fiel. You have a, a guy who is willing to throw the body, willing to play a power forward style game, willing to muck it up in front of the net. Of course, he's proven he's willing to drop the mitts. And for a skilled guy like Antti Suomelo, whether, you know, he would admit it or not, you know, I'm sure he's thinking less and gets to just focus on what makes him a great player, and that's his skill. So um, VL is a guy that fills a role in the organization that there's not a lot of other guys that do, and that's a reason why they signed him to the contract they did this offseason after he signed an AHL deal the year before. He comes from a winning pedigree. He has leadership qualities from the Quebec League when they signed him. So a lot to like from this guy. I mean, he has, you know, he's already an assistant captain year number two. His future has captain writ all, written all over him at the AHL level. And I would expect eventually he'll get a look up at the NHL level as well. I know the game is going away from, you know, kind of that side where, where you guys are asked to fight. But it's still in the game. He can still play as well. He's not just going to drop the mitts. He still has an offensive game to him, too. So I think he's a guy fans should get to know. He's already, I think, a fan favorite in the AHL for all the things that he does. So, um, you know, last year as a rookie, he had 11 goals, 11 assists, and also had, I think, over 90 penalty minutes. So, you know, he's a bit of a throwback in that way. And, again, he fills a role that, you know, you can't really look at many other guys in the organization that, you know, do all the things that he does. Nope. We seem to have lost Lacey. His audio went kaput. <laughs> and there he's I back. Am. There he is. He's back. <laughs> no, I was just going to say that I really think that his game can translate to the NHL just for everything that he brings. Because like you said, Nick, uh, you don't really see players who can only fight or only can do one thing. You need multiple attributes. And I think VL brings a lot, kind of like how Leon Bergman brings a lot to the table. He's feisty. He can set up goals. He can score goals, the whole package. So uh, I definitely like what you say and looking, looking forward to seeing Jeff VL, hopefully get a call up here in a year or two. Well, you know, speaking of Bergman on our last episode, when we talked to Nick, that was his prediction, that Bergman was probably going to be the next to get the call. Would you like to pr- make another prediction for the next player you think might get the call? Well, the big club's starting to get healthy, so I don't know if you know they're going to be knocking on the door as much, and especially with the way things are going right now in the AHL over the last you know couple weeks. A little bit hard to say, hey, can we call somebody up when you guys aren't winning any games? And there's really been no one that's, that's driving the bus over the last couple of weeks, but... Bergman's going to be a guy who's in the mix all year. If you're taking to start to find his groove, they'll start looking at him again. I, I know the way he struggled a little bit. Obviously, you know, if Suomela can carry this through a few weeks, I mean, they would like him to be up there. He was one of the biggest free agent signings for the organization two years ago. He's certainly a guy, you know, from the back end, um, you know, as you continue to progress, I think Jake Middleton will be a guy that's going to be up and down this year as a depth defenseman. Um, immediately right now, it's, it's hard to circle any particular guy just because of the way things are going. Um, but I would think Bergman will get another, you know, another look in the next, in the next couple weeks. And, uh, you know, we'll see, we'll see who else can kind of elevate their game and start to get the attention of the brass. Well, you make a great point about Middleton getting healthy, which triggered in my mind, will, would there be any room for him with the Sharks? Because obviously right now, with the return of Redeem Shimmick, hashtag the Redeemer, <laughs> but you've got Shimmick and Burns, you got Vlasic and Carlson at this point, Dylan and Heed, but obviously Prout slots in there. There's a few options available, and we still haven't even mentioned the name Mario Ferraro, who I think we would all agree on has made a good impact on the club to begin this season. So it makes me wonder, would there be room for Middleton or would it be a situational call-up depending on the team you're playing that night? 
It's. I think it depends on injuries. It depends on health. I mean, the flexibility you have with Jake is he's on an entry level contract, so you can put him up and down. And the same thing can be said with with Mario. But I think Mario's kind of solidified himself, at least for the time being, that he's an NHL defenseman on an you know an every night basis. Um, Jake hasn't really necessarily been given that chance. Um, a different skill set though. He's a stay at home, big body style defenseman. The injury threw him a little bit behind the eight ball just because of the situation. I mean. With Prout getting injured as well, it could have been an opportunity for him to, you know, maybe be a sixth or seventh D. Um, at this point, though, too much of a log jam, I think, for him to, to leapfrog anybody right now currently, which I think is a good thing. That's why you have a guy like Jake Middleton. You know, he is an NHL quality D man, but you don't need him, you know, at this point, which which is a positive. It means you're healthy. Well, I think this could be, well, it should be, obviously, greatly beneficial for the Barracuda to have Jake Middleton around because we've seen what Redeem Shimmick, I hate to say that one guy can all of a sudden throw everything into alignment, but Redeem Shimmick gets called up the Sharks and things start to go their way. Maybe Jake Middleton getting back into the Barracuda lineup puts everyone where they need to be and this team starts turning or turning it around themselves. So that's a great, I mean, that's a good point. I think that's a great point. I mean, it's hard to, what Jake has added for the Barracuda over the last three is hard to measure just, you know, his style of play and his leadership quality and a little bit of a grizzled vet at this stage in his AHL career. And, you know, of course he wants to be up in the NHL who doesn't want to be, you know, as a professional hockey player, but he also recognizes that, you know, there's a lot of depth at the position, um, and also recognizes an opportunity to get some games. I mean, it almost helps the fact that he hasn't played in so long. I'm sure he wants to get back out there, and whether it's in the NHL or the AHL, it probably doesn't matter to him right now. Well, um, Kevin, is are, are you done with the interrogation? <laughs> <laughs> Nick, how'd I do? I've been uh, wanting to, to ask you questions here for the last few weeks, and I'm sorry I haven't been able to get out here. Hey, yeah. all good. Appreciate it. I know we've been a uh, little communication over the last few years on Twitter and stuff, but uh, yeah. nice to officially meet you and, and uh, through, uh, I guess, uh, video here, not even in person, but nice to meet you. <laughs> we'll, we'll make it happen. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so let's uh, get a few promotions out of the way here. What is the next CUDA Confidential? When is that dropping? What was the last one and what's the next one? Yeah, we had part two of our uh, little sit down with Joel Shulman that uh, dropped Tuesday. We're trying to drop him every Tuesday. So, you know, usually at the latter part of the day, um, just because we don't play too many Tuesdays. We do play Mondays sometimes. And um, of course, the biggest promotion is Sunday, 408 night. Barracuda will be wearing some really cool uh, San Jose uh, City inspired jerseys. Of course, we're having that eating contest. Uh, Joey Chestnut, Matt Stoney. They're going to try to put down, uh, you know, 80 plus uh, Eagle waffles in eight minutes. So, uh, that's the big one. That should be a lot of fun. Um, I actually, I don't know if you guys are aware. I was in an eating contest with those guys, um, and uh, it was it was. Tacos. When did you tap out? Um, I, so if you can believe this, I I ate seventeen uh, tacos, and they ate. Well, I know Chestnut ate about ninety six. So and I was I laid on a, it was outdoors. I laid on the park bench for about twenty minutes, and I was ha- having like meat sweats. So um, <laughs> these guys are they're nuts. So it should be pretty fun though. Um, You're you nuts. Were, you put away 17. I know. I don't know what I was thinking. I, I don't know what I was thinking. And the, they they weren't overly big. They, I mean, to to be honest, but still, I was like 17 is not bad. So, no, just, but I, I, it impressed. gave me a little bit of idea what's going on with these guys. It's it's just that's nuts. ridiculous. <laughs> so right, now, is this happening at center ice? Are they going to put a drop cloth down like they do for uh, Chuck a Puck? Or I don't think. I think it's during. It's in one of the bombs. I think they're kind of isolating a few chairs and they're gonna put some tables and stuff so it won't be on the ice i don't believe as far as i know um but diego waffle was invented in san jose so it just ties into the whole theme um of course matt stoney joey chestnut both natives of, of san jose um so i mean these guys these guys are pretty crazy it's the real deal though it's um to get these guys out it's part of the major league eating umbrella so i mean you can't just ask them to come out and eat, you know eat something as as part of promotion you've got to go through their actual, you know, affiliated professional eating organization. So it's quite, it's quite the real deal. <laughs> oh my Lord. Uh, well, let's tell the people about a few more things that are also upcoming uh, Friday, November 22nd. Of course, the annual teddy bear toss game, both the November 22nd and 23rd games, of course, being orange Jersey day. So yes. make sure, 
throw down <laughs> your orange for that. And then, of course, the big one that a lot of people are looking forward to, Friday, November 29th, Black Friday. You know it. You love it. Uh, this one, of course, part one of a three-part series, Bobbleheads, that interconnect with each other. The first series featuring Timo Meyer and Aaron Dell. So we have seven games coming up. So we'll speak with you again, two with Tucson, two with Colorado, San Diego again, and Bakersfield. I look forward to the payback in SoCal <laughs> after the historical loss next or last week. Uh, Nick, thank you so much for checking in once again, and we will talk to you in a couple weeks. All right, guys. Thank you. Thank you.